Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see such a full house. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Welcome to the Friends of the McGill Library 2017 Shakespeare Lecture. Mon nom est Anne Vroom et je suis la présidente des Amis de la Bibliothèque de McGill. Il me fait grand plaisir de vous accueillir ce, ici ce soir, en si grand nombre, à notre conférence Shakespeare de 2017. Ce soir, nous avons le grand plaisir d'accueillir comme conférencier un artiste renommé du théâtre, du cinéma et de la télévision, Scott Wentworth. In his talk this evening, Scott is going to share with us his insights in, with this talk entitled Julius Caesar before the rehearsal, his insights on the extensive preparations that a director has to do before he actually meets with the actors on stage. The Shakespeare Lecture was established by the Friends of the Library in 1992, one of three free public lectures that we host throughout the year. We're very proud to present this lecture series each year in partnership with Canada's Stratford Festival. J'aimerais remercier très sincèrement nos commanditaires ce soir, Hilary Pearson et Michael Sabia. Nous en sommes très reconnaissants de leur générosité envers cette conférence depuis cinq ans. Hilary Pearson and Michael Sabia have been generously sponsors of this Shakespeare lecture for five years now. We are deeply grateful for their sponsorship of the arts and in the life of the arts in general here at, at McGill and also throughout Canada. A vast amount of important material on Shakespeare is available throughout McGill's library system through our humanities and social sciences libraries, as well as in our rare books and special collections. These include some of the earliest editions of Shakespeare's plays, namely a copy of the second folio from 1632, and two copies of the fourth folio from 1685. Rare treasures indeed. The Friends of the Library is a volunteer group of advocates who work to nurture community interest in McGill's library by hosting lectures and events throughout the year. We also provide financial support for critical acquisitions and programs for the library. We are proud to have contributed financially to the library's Fiat Lux feasibility study, which produced the blueprint to reimagine and renovate McGill's, McLennan, and Redpath libraries to meet the evolving needs of research, pedagogy, and technology for 21st century. This innovative Fiat Lux project will feature boldly in the university's next capital campaign, and one we hope that all friends of the library will support with enthusiasm. Stay tuned for more details in the coming months. By the way, for those whose Latin may be a little bit rusty, fiat lux means let there be light. And this was a phrase that was found carved in the entablature over the entrance, the original entrance of the Red Path Library during the feasibility study. A truly fitting concept, we think, for the world that awaits anyone who enters the library. I'd now like to call upon Professor Paul Yaknan to come up and formally introduce our speaker. Paul is the Tomlinson Professor of Shakespeare Studies and a former director of the Institute for the Public Life of the Arts at McGill. Paul, would you come up? Thank you, Anne, and thanks to the Friends of the Library. Uh, and thank you for everybody for being here. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to introduce Scott Wentworth. Um, as you know, Scott is an eminent director in Canada and beyond. Uh, he directed Romeo for the 2017 season at uh, Stratford. Um, it was fabulous. It was a fabulous version of the play. And the best thing I can say about it, the most true thing I can say about it, it was like watching Misty Copeland dance. It was irradiated by intelligence and feeling, every single piece of it. He has directed, and I'm leaving out tons, he has directed Henry IV, parts one and two, Pericles, Richard III at Bard on the Beach in Vancouver. He has been resident director at the Shakespeare Theatre of New Jersey, where he directed The Winter's Tale and Othello, among other plays. Um, he uh, directed uh, Love's Labour's Lost and other plays at Santa Cruz. He's not just a director. He's also, as you know, uh, one of the most successful actors in North America. On Broadway, he has played Count Vronsky in Anna Karenina. 
uh, and he starred in Cy Coleman's Welcome to the Club, where, which was nominated, he was nominated for a Tony Award. He is a veteran, 20-year veteran of the Stratford Festival. Uh, he has played, among other parts, Iago Macbeth, uh, opposite Shauna McKenna, uh, which must have been fabulous, uh, Bosala in The Duchess of Malfi by Webster, and Henry IV. He was the first actor, I believe, to play Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof and Shylock in The Merchant of Venice in Rep. Somehow that doesn't tire him out, because he's also a playwright. Um, his playwriting includes librettos for two musicals, Gunmetal Blues and Enter the Guardsmen. Gunmetal Blues has been staged um, hundreds of times all over the world. Uh, Enter the Guardsmen, um, excuse me, was premiered at, in London at the Donmer Warehouse and uh, received the 1998 nomination for the Olivier Prize for the best new musical. He, his work, The Man in the Iron Mask, was conditioned by the Shakespeare Santa Cruz uh, Festival, Shakespeare Festival, and it received its world premiere in Santa Cruz in 2012. And that's all I'm gonna tell you. He will tell you the rest, Scott. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I, I want to thank the friends of the McGill Library for inviting me. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I am directing the 2018 season production of Julius Caesar, uh, which will go into rehearsal in June. Uh, of, of next season uh, at the Stratford Festival. Um, and so I, I, I thought I would, I would lecture tonight about, uh, it's, it's, it's called Julius Caesar Before the Rehearsal Room. This is a clever way of me talking about what's going on exactly right now in my life, trying to keep everything straight. I hope you'll find it interesting. Uh, it's gonna help me a lot. <laughs> so you guys can be my guinea pigs a little bit. One of the things that happens, and, and I, 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 let me preface this by, by saying, this is about me and, 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 and my process. I, I don't pretend that, that all directors think this way or work this way, uh, and I'm certainly not saying that mine is, is the only way or the best way, but I just wanted to give you guys a, a, a glimpse in, in, into what my life has been like in the last two months and will continue to be for the next almost a year. Um, the first thing that happens to me as, as, as a director when I'm, when I'm, when I'm offered uh, uh, the opportunity to direct a, a, a play, particularly a Shakespeare play, is, is it's, it's almost schizophrenic. It's, uh, two thought processes begin uh, at once. Uh, and they're, they're very distinct, and in many ways, they're completely contradictory. On the one hand, you immediately have to start making decisions, right? Especially at Stratford, because the actors who are, are going to be in Julius Caesar uh, will also be in, in at least two other plays. I'm sharing a company with three other productions. Uh, so that has to get all lined up very far in advance. At the height of the season, 14 plays, even next year with the, with the, uh, the uh, Tom Patterson Theater being uh, taken out of the uh, uh, equation because it's going to be uh, torn down and, and rebuilt anew from my mouth to God's ears. <laughs> We're having some issues with our local council, uh, but hopefully that will all go forward. Um, and so, um, see, I lost my train of thought because I so, but, it, but anyway, my, yes, thank you. See, I knew this would be helpful. So you've got to make all these decisions, right? You've got to make all these decisions. You've got to, you've got to decide uh, uh, what the actors are going to be standing on, uh, uh, what period you're going to put it in, right? You've got to, you've got to provide all of these answers because people have to start planning stuff and, and building stuff and making stuff. On the contradictory side, I have to spend the next many months of my life on almost a daily basis rereading this play, Julius Caesar. And and, and, and reading it not so much to find answers, but to find questions, to ask questions of it, to continually ask questions of it. 
Um, the challenge, of course, is when, when, you're, when you're, you're doing the sort of traditional director stuff of blue, not green, that actor, not that actor. You're, you're, you're in a mode where you want to solve things, where you want to answer things, where you want to constantly do that. And it's so important for me uh, with, 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 with a, a Shakespeare play is, is to ask questions of it. Now, why? I was thinking about this on the train uh, up here yesterday, and, and I feel like I need to kind of cop to it. Uh, I've, I've got two fundamental assumptions that I make when, I, when I'm directing a Shakespeare play. And they may seem um, obvious or, or, or naive, but I, I, think it's, I, I think it's worth me copying to them right at, right at the start here so you know sort of what I'm, I'm on about. Because again, not everybody works this way, and nor should they necessarily. Uh, but, but my first assumption is that Shakespeare's plays continue to speak to us, which is also a way of saying they don't really need my help to do that. And the other assumption is that the medium of theater is performance. Now, that might seem really obvious, but it's very helpful for me to remind myself of that as a director because, of course, when the performance occurs, I may or may not be there. So obviously, my participation is not integral to the creation of theater. What I do is, 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 is preparatory to it. And not unlike parenting, there's a certain movement of making yourself superfluous <laughs> so that you have created an autonomous or, or been a part of the creation of an autonomous, uh, uh, in this case, uh, company of actors that can go on to perform the plays. So these, these two working assumptions are, uh, uh, mitigate all of, 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 of those two contradictory states of mind that I find myself in. When I am, I'm looking at the text and, and, and questioning it, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that to try to find out what is, is actually there, because my belief is that the more doors I can open into the play, the better served it will be when I do meet the actors, that they will have more of the play to explore. And the, 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 the first notion of, of, of Shakespeare continuing to speak to us also plays into that because there can be a tendency in, in, in the theater, particularly when we're dealing with, with, with classical texts, uh, if I can coin a phrase, uh, some, sometimes a, 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 a director will, um, will indulge in uh, director splain, <laughs> kind of like mansplain, but director splain, where, where the production kind of says, this is really what Shakespeare's saying. If I can, if I can let, me, let me just tell you what I think Shakespeare's saying. Um, now, that doesn't mean that Shakespeare necessarily can speak for himself. They're just words on a page. They have to be inhabited by actors. They have to be put in, into a context. But even before that can happen, we have to hear them with the ears of our time. You know, and that to me is how poetry continues to speak to us and can gather meaning that in many cases the, the original uh, uh, writer, poet, playwright couldn't foresee. So we, we, we have to listen to it with, with the ears of our time without imposing all of, of, of the values of our time on it, necessarily. Um, and in some cases, this has to be a very active process. When you're dealing with a play like Julius Caesar, it's over 400 years old. That's 400 year of, of tradition of performance, a 400 year tradition of critical and scholarly thinking and writing about the play. 
uh, it has entered our consciousness uh, as a culture, not just as a, as, as a play, but as an historical event. So that complicates it as well. And oftentimes, these plays gather around them a kind of, of, of patina of tradition that in sometimes, in, 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 in some ways, uh, obscures what the play is, is, is actually saying. Um, I used to live in New York City, and I lived on the Upper West Side. And every day when I would go to work, I would walk past the Dakota apartment building. Now, I always felt that the Dakota apartment building was a very sinister place. John Lennon was murdered there. Rosemary's Baby was filmed there. <laughs> it, was, it was a dark, foreboding, it had gargoyles <laughs> on it. It was, it, was, it was a very, very, I would shudder every time I walked past it. And I couldn't imagine why anyone would build such a thing on Central Park. You know, like some evil genius decided that that's what this building needed to look like. Well, one day, as, as, as I'm sure you guys as, as fellow city dwellers uh, have to experience all the time, all of the scaffolding went up, and they were going to do something to it. And so for months, I would walk by, and all, all I would see was plywood. And I could hear them behind there. They've got the water and, and the sand, and they're sandblasting the, the thing, and they're cleaning it up, and they're doing all this stuff. And finally, months later, the, the, the scaffolding comes down, and this dark, ominous, gritty building, I found out that the brick was actually this beautiful golden yellow. <laughs> and it caught the sun off of the, off of the uh, Central Park, and it just glowed. And these, these demon-like uh, gargoyles looked kind of quaint and cute, and <laughs> like they were going to go traipsing off into the into the park and, 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 and have some fun. And I thought, how extraordinary. You know, th my whole association with this, with this building had nothing to do with the original intentions of the architects or the builders, or indeed the people who probably walked past it many, many times in the, in the first hundred years of its life as it accrued all of this dust and grime. And I think sometimes that happens with Shakespeare plays in that we have to actively, as we, as we reread them and rehear them, now in this part of the process, but also in when the actors get there and the rehearsal starts, the rehearsal, that, that, that m a great deal of energy needs to be expended in kind of chipping away at, 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 at these uh, traditions that, that, that grow up around the play. So, so when I'm, when I'm, when I'm rereading the play, I, 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 I try to, to to, to, to really isolate the assumptions that, uh, that, I've, that I've made ab ab about the play or, or, or associations that I've, that I've made about the play and really actively kind of attack them and go, is that true? We did this on Romeo and Juliet this year. You know, I said to the actor playing Benvolio, tell me, tell me about Benvolio. He said, well, you know, he's Romeo's cousin. He's his best friend. And I was like, is he? And he's like, isn't he? <laughs> and I say, he could be. But he doesn't have to be. You know, um, and it's, 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 it's those kind of, 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 of things of, um, that, that, that help us kind of move the, the sandblast, the, uh, that, that outer layer, and, and, and see what's actually going on in there. So the, 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 the rereading process is, is, is hopefully a process that opens doors into the play, that allows you to see more of what's going on in the play. And the hope is that when the actors come, they will have more rooms in this mansion that is the play to play around in and to explore. So we try to keep those doors open. Now on the other side of the equation, when you're making decisions, when you're, when you're, 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 you're providing answers, you can't help but close a door or two because it's that actor instead of that actor. It's this period instead of that period. So how do we keep those doors open is, is, is the real challenge at, at, at this point. Um, one of the things that has to be decided very early because it is, it is a concrete thing, it has to be designed, it has to be built, it has to be costed, is the sets and the costumes. So working with, with uh, my designer, Christina Podubiak, 
on what should this look like. Again, a, a year and a half from when, you know, when we first started talking about it, which, which is also a challenge, eh? You know, sometimes you want to be, you know, timely. You want to say, okay, this, 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 this is a, a story, a play that, that, that speaks to our time. And you make decisions and you, and you make designs. And then a year later, you're like, why does this feel like really sort of dated and like so last year? <laughs> so that's a challenge. Um, I've always said that Shakespeare doesn't need a set, he needs a theater. Right? He did not write for a, a, a theater that was um, overtly scenically inclined. It was either a non-scenic theater or perhaps a pre-scenic theater. But it was, uh, from what we understand about it historically, the, the, the Globe Theater. And, and this was probably one of the uh, three plays that opened the, the, the new Globe Theater. It was uh, uh, an interesting kind of architectural space. It, it had both the tradition of the, uh, the morality plays, the, the, uh, you know, where, a, where a, a wagon was dragged into the courtyard of an inn, and people would stand around it, and people would get on top of the, of the wagon and act out a story. And so it has a linear movement. You enter one door talking, you cross the stage talking, and you exit talking. It's narrative, it's linear, it goes that way. The other thing about the Elizabethan theaters is that it was also a highly metaphorical space, which it owed in its uh, uh, connection with, they're called the Italian theaters, they weren't real theaters, they, they, they were uh, theoretical theaters, uh, they were memory theaters, Francis Yates writes about this uh, and, and, and uncovered a, a lot of this research in, in her work. Uh, but they're highly metaphorical spaces. So you had the heavens above, you had the hell below, you had the tabula rasa where the play took place. And that means that every event in a Shakespeare play can be viewed two ways. It can be viewed narratively and linearly, horizontally, <laughs> and it can be viewed metaphorically, mythologically, vertically. Lear carrying the dead body of Cordelia is an action in a particular narrative. It is also, of course, an image of tragedy because the father should not carry the body of the dead daughter. Hamlet looking into the skull is an event in a narrative, but it's also a mythological image of the young man looking at that death, the long mirror, Joseph Campbell calls it. So part of the desire to, to, to not place these plays on a set, but in a theater, is to access both of those stories and to keep the, the, um, the possibility for both of those stories to be alive in the moment. Now, we're lucky at Stratford because we actually happen to have a theater that was designed by Tyrone Guthrie and Tanya Mazevich. Um, that was set to address these very issues. Often uh, in the past, really in the past like 15, 20 years, we have covered it up for good reasons. You know, you get tired of looking at the wood, I get it. You all know what the festival stage looks like, I think. Um, but, you know, we put platforms on it, we do stuff to it, we cover it up. I'm reminded of a story that Peter Brook writes about in the, in the empty space where he was talking about uh, a civilization that had yet to invent a wheel and so they had to build everything by dragging huge pieces of stone. So of course they had to have slaves because they couldn't afford to hire people to do that sort of thing. So it had this huge effect on, on, on the whole culture, the fact that they hadn't invented the wheel yet. But their kids pulled little toys that had little cylindrical logs on them. The kids pulled the toy, but no one made the connection. And every time we put a set on the festival stage, I always think, you're covering up the wheel. <laughs> Don't cover up the wheel. The wheel can still work. It still has power. 
so we decide, Christina and I, to put Julius Caesar on the festival stage. Partly, again, to keep that door open so that when we discover things in rehearsal with the actors and we want to change something and sometimes we want to change it dramatically because someone gets an insight, it's like, oh, of course, we've staged it completely wrong for our understanding in the moment because no real right or wrong. Um, we can do that, right? We have the, we, and, 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 and I don't have to go to Anthony Cimolino, our artistic director, and go, Anthony, you know that big set I built for, you know, $600,000? We don't need it anymore. <laughs> can I throw it out? Is that okay? <laughs> and we discovered that this year in, 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 in Romeo and Juliet, that, we've, that, that, that the, the, the festival stage did what it was designed to do. And I think at its heart, what it's designed to do is to disappear in the presence of acting. And the better the acting, the more completely it goes away. The scary part about that is, if the acting's not good, you're staring at wood. <laughs> so it's a terrifying space to work in, but it's also a very liberating space to work in. Um, and, and the it doesn't stay an empty space long. In the presence of acting, the space gets populated with the scenery that Shakespeare creates with his language and that we create mutually between actor and audience as I speak, you hear, that old equation from Henry V. Here are the rules of the, of the Shakespeare performance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs of the receiving earth. And he gives you a nice little onomatopoeia there so he, to help you imagine what those horses might, might sound like. So that's a way of keeping a door open. With costumes, how do you keep the door open? They've got to wear something. What are they going to wear? Well, before we get into, this, into the specifics of, of what we've chosen as, as like a period or, or, or a look, I think the most important thing about clothes in a Shakespeare play is that, in fact, we remember that they are indeed clothes, that they're not costumes, that, the, that the, the, the nature of the clothes that these people wear are that they need to be functional, that buttons need to work, that sleeves can be pushed up if they need to. That, what does Lear say? Pray you undo this button several moments before his, his death, because he wants to breathe a little bit, you know? And it reminds us subconsciously that these are real people in real clothes. <laughs> and they need breath, and they, they wear clothes like we do. Um, because everything you, you put on a stage, of course, gives the audience information, eh? Right? And, and the information that is coming from, from Shakespeare's poetry is so dense and so complicated that if, if, the, if the design is giving you too much information at the same time, it's almost like an overload. You can't like deal with it all. Which is why I always try to encourage, especially my costume designers, to not comment on character through the clothes, right? Tybalt's fiery, so we'll dress him in red. <laughs> Romeo is poetic, we'll dress him in blue. And it's like, well, what if Romeo has a fiery moment? And what if, what if Tybalt has a moment where he goes, man, I feel really bad. We're subconsciously saying to the audience, you know, that's not who they really are. They're really these guys. That's the poetic one, that's the fiery one. So it encourages us to look at the play in kind of broad strokes, whereas I think Shakespeare's writing encourages us to look at this play, uh, all, all of his plays, in incredibly subtle detail. Um, most people in, 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 a, uh, in any sort of group of society, you, we're, we're kind of, you know, we look kind of the same. I mean, if, if someone came from Mars, they'd get an idea of how we dress now. You know, they might, if they're really clever, go, oh, you know, this, 
I can tell this person uh, likes this or this person doesn't like that. But in the main, it's, 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 it's the self-expression of, of, of clothing is, is not the paramount uh, importance uh, of them. To Shakespeare's audience, the paramount information that was coming out of the clothing was status, right? Are you of this class, or are you of that class, or are you of that class? And I need to know it in a second. And that's something that's very important, because although we think we live in a classless society, we, of course, don't. It's just gone underground. It's harder to tell. But in Shakespeare's day, you know, you didn't have millionaires shopping at the Gap. You know, it was, it was unheard of, and indeed you could be fined if you dressed outside of your social distinction. And it was ridiculous. It was stuff like, your ruff is an inch too large, Viscount. <laughs> 20 pounds, please. Um, so I encourage uh, 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 the designers to, to think in terms of status uh, and to think in terms of functionality, because those are, are, are two bits of information that the audience can really use to hear the play and rehear the play anew. The big um, answer that we came up with for, for Julius Caesar, and this, this was right at the get-go. This was a, a conversation I had with, with, with Anthony Cimolino, the artistic director. And he suggested to me that we should do Julius Caesar with a gender parity cast, which means we're going to have 12 male actors and 12 female actors. And out of that, we are going to put the play together. Now, for those of you who know Julius Caesar, there are only two women characters in the play, with the possible exception of Time of Athens. It's, it's the most male-centric play uh, that he wrote. The two women don't even have a scene together, which is very unusual for Shakespeare. Um, now, I was really pleased to take on this challenge for a number of reasons. Um, we, uh, when I say we, I mean Stratford as a, as, as a theater the last few years, have experimented with this, but on a relatively small scale. Um, Sean McKenna famously played uh, Richard III a few seasons ago. Um, but that was the only gender switching in, in that production. Several minor characters in recent years. There was a Rinalda in The Last Hamlet instead of a Rinaldo. There was a Madam Snake in the School for Scandal this year. Um, I have, in both Pericles and Romeo and Juliet, replaced the male authoritative uh, narrative voice with a female feminine mother voice um, in both of those plays. But probably the most extensive uh, 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 rethinking of gender in, in casting occurred in The Breath of Kings, which was season before last. And, and I think Graham Abbey spoke last year. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't complete uh, gender parity in the casting, but the women were, were, were featured throughout the play um, in, in the traditional male roles. And in, by and large, it was quite successful that. Um, but I did notice when I saw it, that the actors playing Richard II, Henry IV, Falstaff, and Henry V, in other words, the four leads, were all men. And I thought, we need to avoid that if we're going to really have, uh, uh, really explore the notion of, of, of gender in this, in this play. So part of the casting process became not just who would be the best person for this part, necessarily, but, but also, how can we keep the two gender voices speaking all the time? How can we not lose one and pick up another uh, and have to reset our thinking? And so that was very challenging, because, and, and, it, and it extenuated the casting process, because your first choice for Brutus might be Jonathan Goad, who accepted his, his uh, offer, by the way, so he'll be playing Brutus. 
But, but, but the second choice might have been an actress, right? So it was a little, I, I kept saying it's a little like, like back in the old Star Trek series where, where Spock used to play that three-dimensional chess and my mind would explode. I'm like, no, there's too many planes. But I felt like that, right? <coughs> so eventually, Shauna McKenna will be playing Julius Caesar. You can see her picture on our website. She looks very good. Um, and again, were it not for, for the fact that, that she is a woman, she would, have either, she would have either been the obvious choice to play it this year or she would have already played this part, right? Um, Jonathan Goad, I told you, will, will, will be playing Brutus. Irene Poole will be playing Cassius. She was in The Breath of Kings. You might remember her from Peter Hinton's production of, of uh, The Taming of the Shrew. And Michelle Jaloux uh, will be playing Mark Antony. So I, uh, I erred in the, in, the, in, the, in the side of the women in, in, the, in the three major roles and then gave the title role to one as well. Um, so this complicates not just the casting process, but it also then falls over into all of the other aspects of it. There are sort of two major ways eh, that, 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 that traditionally, and, and you know, traditionally is like the last 10 or 15 years, this, there's not a long tradition of this. You can go back to the 19th century, and yes, Sarah Bernhardt played Hamlet. And even when I was in high school, which was almost the 19th century, um, I saw Dame Judith Anderson at age 70 play Hamlet. And it was weird at the beginning, because you know, there was my Grammy in black tights. <laughs> But she was such a remarkable actress that, you know, five minutes into her part of, 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 of the play, she's Hamlet, she's telling the story, and we're fine until the sword fight. It was a little <laughs> calm at the end. <laughs> but fantastic, right? But the, okay, so, the, so the, the two ways of, of, um, of dealing with, with, with this. One is to create a world, either real or imagined, where women could have the positions that the male figures in the play have, right? So you said it in, you know, modern times where, well, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> you know, but yeah, you said it in Margaret Thatcher's England and Mrs. Thatcher is Caesar, or, or uh, Harriet Walter did, uh, uh, recently did a production in England uh, they set the whole play in, in a, a, a woman's prison and, and the prisoners were putting on a performance of Julius Caesar. You come up with a notion, right? And the other way is to say, is, is not gender just another relic or remnant of our notion that Shakespeare, and it's a 19th century notion, that Shakespeare is essentially a realistic writer in the style of Tolstoy and that these plays kind of only make sense that way. And so, and we've, we've, you know, we've knocked down a lot of those walls. In, in, in my lifetime, I, mean, I remember as a young actor, uh, there, were, you know, there were great discussions uh, 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 about, about, about racial diversity in, 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 in Shakespeare, you know? Um, and, and the arguments came kind of from, a, again, from a realism perspective with a capital R. It's like, well, sure, James Earl Jones can be King Lear. He's great. But, like, but all of his daughters ought to be black, because that doesn't make sense. If, they, if one of them is white and one of them is Asian, well, that's crazy. You know, we had to train ourselves, right? We had to train ourselves to go, all right, that's not how these plays function, you know? Jonathan Goad just played Hamlet. He's not Danish. <laughs> He's really not. Um, so, so is gender the next relic of, of, of realism that, 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 that needs to be addressed? Because, of course, remember, these plays, were, were, when they were first performed, they were performed by all men. Boys played the girls' parts. Um, this was, you know, not for artistic reasons. The, the acting companies grew out of the guilds. The guilds were working men. Uh, it was a patriarchal society. They, that's the way they were. So, you know, they, they were never meant to be, to be taken completely realistically. 
so this then filters over into my reading of the play, right? As I said, it's, this, is, uh, this is an incredibly masculine-oriented play. The two women uh, uh, have no public life. They are, they are relegated to the hearths, Calpurnia and, and uh, Portia. They're both wives. They're both giving good advice to their husbands, and they're both being ignored. Which I think, under any circumstance, one would, one would see that and one would understand it. But, but, if, it was a, but if, it, if it was a bunch of guys and just two women in the room, that might not be the main thing one hears. But knowing that, that half the company are going to be actresses, when I was rereading the play with my modern ears, all, all I kept hearing was, not all I kept hearing, but, but one of the main things I kept hearing was this larger question, which is, if a society like Rome, like Shakespeare's England, like modern-day Canada and the United States, if, if, we, if, we are, if we have a culture that extols male masculine virtues, qualities, to such an extent that they become almost a fetish, aggressiveness, competitiveness, individuality, and we, conf and, and we say that those are the only attributes that, are, that belong in the public discourse, that belong in the forum, and if, we, and if we consign the feminine energy, the energy about creativity, the energy of, 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 of groupthink, to the hearth, and we don't allow them a public voice, then the question to me becomes, is a democracy even possible? And is tyranny inevitable? The big question of the Renaissance, of course, was, was Caesar a, a monster or was he the savior? Was Brutus an assassin or was he a hero? And everyone from Dante on down answered that question. But it was, it was a hot topic in the Renaissance. And characteristically, by the time it gets to Shakespeare, he chooses not to answer it. He just chooses to keep asking both sides of the question. So we see both sides of Caesar. We see both sides of Brutus, right? This is part of, 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 of the dynamic of the play. Uh, I was talking to an American friend of mine who, who uh, had seen the uh, last summer's production of Julius Caesar in the park, where they dressed up the actor playing Caesar like Donald Trump. Which, which, which is a, it's a history of how people do this play. Orson Welles started it back in the 30s. He, he, he you know, with, with, with his uh, Julius Caesar, it was called Caesar, Death of a Dictator. And they, uh, uh, it was sort of a Mussolini kind of, uh, um, kind of Caesar. Um, and this normally happens in theater. The theater's normally left of center, so they cast Caesar, who is a kind of right-wing figure, and then they kill him. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I think, that's, that's a lot less complicated than this play is. And I said to my friend, who was an American, I said to my friend, you know, the thing about this play is that, that, that Caesar is both Trump and Obama. That's the problem. That's why we keep revisiting this play. And that's why I think the mythological story that I'm suggesting, which is this notion of, 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 of the, the, the politically fetishizing male behavior and banishing the feminine energy, banishing the goddess. Is, is democracy possible? Is dictatorship inevitable? Because Caesar kind of knew better than anybody else what should be done. I don't want to listen to you guys. I fixed the calendar. <laughs> I fixed the clocks. <laughs> I, I invented public parks. Why do I have to sit around and wait for you guys to debate? Why? Why? I can get this done. You know? Those are the, those are, but those are big questions, right? That's not just, oh, I don't like Mussolini. He's evil. 
you know, I don't like Donald Trump, he's stupid, or, or, or whatever. This is a way more complicated play. And my hope is that the, the, um, the entrance of, of women en masse into this story next summer will allow us to really get a hold of that story in a way that perhaps a male actor might go, yeah, that's probably true. I guess we're sort of idiots sometimes, but <laughs> friends, Romans, you know. <laughs> we want to see what the women have to say about us. And I think the, 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 the clearest way to do that is, is, is not to create a world where, um, where the women are in power, because that, that, again, signals to the audience that they are as culpable for this. And I, th I don't think Shakespeare's saying that. Um, I have found, and again, it might just be my modern ears, but I have found in, in, in Romeo and Juliet and in Pericles a couple of years ago that Shakespeare, for all of his uh, seeming uh, conservatism, um, was actually he was pretty ruthless at, at, at putting the real stories on the stage. And it's very dangerous. I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, it's always very dangerous to, 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 to look at uh, you know, Shakespeare's biography and say, oh, well, he obviously wrote this because this happened to him, partly because we don't know enough about his biography and partly because how do you do that with any writer, especially a writer as great as Shakespeare? But the one thing we do know about him is he was the father of twins. And one of them was a boy, and one of them was a girl, and the boy died. And there's a lot in the, in the dramaturgy, from, from, from Comedy of Errors, Twelfth Night, Tempest, and on a metaphorical level, the separation of the male and female, the separation of the masculine and the feminine, which I think he saw reflected in his society which is still something that plagues us today, is something that he constantly writes about in those great end plays, The Winter's Tale, Cymbeline, Pericles, The Tempest. He's about the return of those two forces together, an imagined future that doesn't end in tragedy, that moves beyond those, those, those tragedies. So, so for a play like Julius Caesar, which, which uh, uh, Paul reminded me today uh, forgot its Ovid, I think he didn't completely forget it. I think that the possibility of transformation is, 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 is there. I think the seeds of, of, of that is, is there in the mythological story. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, uh, my, my hope is that, that, the, uh, that, the, that the women will tell us a few things about what it is to be a man. Are there any questions? <laughs> Seriously, anybody have any questions? Yes? It's a comment, really. Our Shakespeare in the Park a couple of years ago did an all female <coughs> And after about five minutes, you weren't thinking about it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I think, in a way, all female is easier. You know, I, 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 think, I think mixing it up, I mean, it's, sometimes it's, it's, on a, it's like, oh, God, I can't put that actor in that scene with that actress. It, you know, I mean, it's just physically, you know, you, you have to think about those things as well because you don't want to draw people's heads out of the story. You want to constantly keep them engaged in the story. Your uh, production will clearly require attention to nuance and uh, thoughtfulness on the part of the audience. But I'd be interested in your observations as to how you're dividing the characters. You've given the two, uh, let's call it, dictatorial leads to women, and you've cast the Republican hero supporter of the Republic, not Republican, um, <laughs> as, as a man, and uh, do you feel that this will play with loyalties and perceptions on the part of the audience? It's interesting, yes, but, but, but that also presupposes that I think, or that the audience is supposed to think, that Brutus is a Republican hero. You know, he is, and he's not. You know, he's, he, you know he, he convinces himself of that, perhaps, but he also does something that, that steps completely outside of, of 
the acceptable behavior for a, a Republican slash Democratic hero. Um, you know, it's, it's everybody in this play has that dual nature, right? Cassius is, 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 is both a, a, a patriot and, 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 and an incredibly bitter personalized uh, antagonist. Mark Antony is genuinely a friend and supporter of Caesar, and he's quite capable of, of taking those very real emotions and using them to twist a crowd and turn them into people that drive trucks into people. So, so it's, it's, it's complicated, and it will take a very, a very nuanced approach to make sure that, that, that all of those uh, uh, persona are, 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 are available to the audience for, for, the, for the storytelling and not, and not simply to read this as, um, as, a, as a single, simple narrative. Yeah. Yeah, um, it was talking about, talk about uh, 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 how, how t t casting the d different genders affected the, the, um, casting, the, female the casting the female actors and, and, and how, that, how that all played out. You know, it, it, was, it was very incremental and, and, and in the main, I tried to make it about um, who I thought would be very interesting in the part and then kind of step back and go, oh, okay, wait a minute. Um, Shauna, for instance, uh, uh, we had a, we had a, a long talk. Uh, we're both doing Long Day's Journey into Night uh, next year. Did you all know that? Shauna and I. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very excited about that. Um, so, so she knew she was going to be in Julius Caesar, and I said, what do you want to play? Because, you know, she's Shauna. She's a great actor. She could conceivably play Brutus or Cassius or Caesar or Morellus if she felt like it. Um, and she said, let me think about it. Jonathan Goad, who is also going to be playing, here's where the rep gets interesting, he's going to be playing Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird, right? And he's coming into my play through that. And I said, you've already played Mark Antony. Do you want to play him again, or do you want to play a different part? And he said, let me think about it. <laughs> Actually, what he really said, like all actors, was, I'd rather play Cassius. They, all actors want to play Cassius. I don't know why. Um, I, I kind of coerced him into playing Brutus because I, I thought that would be better for everybody. I don't know. I did want Cassius and Brutus to split the gender um, equation because they play so many of their scenes together, and that's what I meant about I didn't want to suddenly go from hearing two men or two women to, to having to reintroduce that. I decided, I decided that no matter who played Brutus or who played Caesar, actresses would play their wives. Partly because Calpurnia and Portia are pretty good parts, and I thought that, that actresses should have a chance to play them. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm really tired of men playing women in Shakespeare. <laughs> I, I don't care if you're Mark Rylance. I don't care. It's, I'm, I'm just a little tired of it. So again, I, I, I didn't want it to be an intellectual conceit where, where we go, oh, well, if, if Sean is playing Caesar, then Calpurnia's got to be Bob. <laughs> so there was no grand scheme. It, just, it kind of worked its way out on, on, on an individual basis. Yes? You've obviously seen many productions of Caesar, um, Julius Caesar. I'm wondering. I was, I was in two productions as an actor. I played Mark Antony in 1990 at Stratford, and I played Brutus in California, 2009. Um, so it's hard. It's hard for me to to. It's easy when you see a production, I think, to get it out of your head as a director. I think it's harder. It's one of the challenges of being an actor who also directs, is when you're in a production. 
you don't have that, that distance to look at it. It's, 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 it's in your body, even if you don't like it. You know, even if you're like, oh, I hate this production. It's in your body. You own it. You have to support it. Uh, uh, and so you, you, I'm connected to it in, in a way. So, so I very consciously have been, you know, going over those two productions. I go to archives, you know, you can, you, can, you can look at the archival video and really try to go, okay, what was it that we did? And was that the play or was that somebody's idea of the play? And, and, and look, you know, if, you don't have to throw away all of the tradition, you know. Some, some traditions are great because they still speak to us. Um, but they shouldn't be confused with the play itself. That's, that, that's, 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 that's my point. Um, so yeah, I, I have to actively work harder to get the productions out of my head that, um, that I've been in than the ones I've seen. But then ultimately, you'll just, you know, if, if something's good, you'll steal it. <laughs> you know, I've got no problem with that. <laughs> Mr. Roberts. Yes. How do you decide what you don't want? What Shakespeare? What was the play that Shakespeare was meant to write? <laughs> yes. Talk about editing the text and spending time with the text, and 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 are there things that one doesn't want? Um, we're blessed with Julius Caesar in in that it's a relatively short play, comparatively speaking. It's I think it's like the seventh shortest that he wrote. Um, if he indeed did write this as, as a play that opened the, the New Globe Theater, it's bookended by, by the very wordy As You Like It in prose and the equally wordy Henry V in verse. Um, did he run out of words? Probably not. Um, it's, it is, it's a terse play. It, it's, 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 it's a play that has gotten a reputation through productions of being uh, kind of intellectual and straightforward. Uh, uh, coming from more of the head than the heart. I don't think that's true. The more I read it and the more I live in this world, I think there are a few things that get the emotions going quite so much as politics, um, which is what the play is about. I mean, no one's, no one's engaging in conflict over love. No one's trying to get a crown. Even Caesar seems very ambivalent about it. But everyone is passionate about talking about what Rome should be, what Canada should be, what America should be. We live in this world. Right? Um, so you don't have to cut it for length. Um, it also, uh, uh, most of Shakespeare's plays uh, come to us, the original documents, in, in different forms. Uh, there's the first folio, which was published after Shakespeare's death by two of his colleagues. Uh, and there are the quartos, uh, the cheaper kind of Elizabethan paperbacks that, uh, you know, who, who knows where they came from. Uh, but they were, they were pirated. They were, you know, it's like somebody with a, with a smartphone at a movie. And then they sell it to you on the street. <laughs> I, bought, I bought one of those for my, my son when he was young. <laughs> I got it home and I was like, look, I just got the new Monsters, Inc. movie. It was only a dollar. And it's all fuzzy and then like a guy stands up and walks out. <laughs> anyway. Um, but, but, uh, uh, so, so my tendency with, with, with Caesar is, is to leave in as much as I can because, because I don't have to worry about, about the excesses of time. Um, and I can then kind of fully explore his dramaturgy. My sense is that because we are more visually oriented than, than his audience was, and indeed our, our, the architecture of our theaters make that possible, lights and the way the seats are, um, that maybe some of the dialogue that, that is necessary in a more verbal theater to create those wars and battles that we never really see at the end, that we might be able to do something with staging that would be more effective. Um, there's a couple of weird things in the folio uh, that, that uh, uh, later editors have fixed um, that maybe don't need to be fixed. Brutus says to Lucius, his little servant, at one point, uh, when he's in the garden thinking about killing Caesar, he says, uh, is today the Ides of Mar is tomorrow the Ides of March? And Lucius says, I don't know. <laughs> and Brutus says, well, go, uh, go get a calendar. Go get an almanac. Find out. And then he comes back and he says, yeah, it's the Ides of March. Well, in the folio, <laughs> what Brutus actually says is, Lucius, is today the first of March? And he says, I don't know. He says, well, go look in the almanac. He goes in the almanac, comes back, he says, March has wasted 15 days. Kind of interesting. 
if you don't fix it. Now, I mean, not only did Caesar famously fix the calendars, but also that, that disassociation of time for Brutus it might be something very interesting for an actor to play with. So we try to keep that ball in the air. Um, so I, I expect we'll explore a relatively full text on this one. In Romeo and Juliet, you, it was just, you know, we couldn't afford to go over the three hours at Stratford. It's a rep. We have to, you know, pay people. It's too much. Uh, so you, you have to make big decisions, right? You have to make big decisions about what can stay and what can go. Um, but that also then impacts on how you stage it, right? Uh, if you accept my notion that Shakespeare continues to speak to us, um, you want to leave in as much as you can, which means that you have to stage it in a way that allows you to do that. So any extra stuff that I want to put in, I go, is it better than what I'm cutting? Because if it's not, maybe I should let Shakespeare have his say and you know, I'll do my little trick somewhere else. Um, so, are those, so those kinds of questions in, in most Shakespeare plays are, 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 are very important. I think, I think we'll, we'll slide by some here because, like I said, it's a relatively uh, terse piece of writing. Let me invite, first of all, Joel Goldberg is going to come and do the thank you. But we can do a little preliminary thank you. A preliminary thank you. Thank you all. I'll sit next to you. Which one that way? There he is. He snuck back in. I'm sitting here. Well, first thing I want to say is that obviously we have a standing room only crowd tonight, <laughs> which is to say, since uh, the critics haven't uh, I know. You know, commented, it's. Uh, clearly a testimony to you, your reputation has preceded you, and we've seen why. So uh, on behalf of uh, the Friends of the Library, uh, I want to thank you more formally, but I certainly want to say thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your, uh, your wisdom and your knowledge about these wonderful plays. It was my pleasure, thank you. Uh, I think that, uh, thank you. I think that most of us, you know, we get into the theater and the um, curtain goes up and the lights come on and we see this wonderful, seamless, smooth presentation of the final expression of what you've, you know, uh, tried to describe for us. Uh, but um, we're not really focusing on how it got there. You know, I have Sean McKenna once said to us, you go from the page to the stage. Yeah. And when you say that you want to, uh, for the actors, open doors to understanding, I get the sense that that's what you wanted to do for us tonight, is to open some doors into how it got from the mm -hmm. page to that seamless, smooth, wonderful presentation that we're used to seeing. And so uh, I want to thank you for that. And the thing that struck me, I think, the most is, I don't know whether other people uh, had the same sense, but I mean, um, the enormous complexity of that process is really, I mean, it's awestruck. Uh, striking. I mean, I, it's, it's, you know, I got the sense it's only because you're so articulate that you can come here and try and um, express to us in a sort of concise form this uh, massive exercise that you've been going through for decades, you know, in terms of how to engage with these plays. Mm -hmm. and, and what we see is the final product, but not all of that stuff. And I don't know if any of us would have any way of, of even getting a glimpse of it if, if, if you hadn't been able to come and, and give us some sense of, as to what that is. So I think that next time the lights go on and the curtain goes up, we're all going to have a much deeper and better understanding of what that process is and that it's not just that seamless, smooth thing. It's all part of the same, and it's an ongoing, never-ending process. So thank you very much for opening that door for all of us, for sure. Thank you. And I just have one other comment. I don't know if you, if you share it, but I think that, you know, um, you're so experienced and so knowledgeable, and clearly this is a, a passion and a calling. Yes. Um, that, uh, you know, you speak to us in, um, in a way, it's, it's kind of very matter of fact. This is the way we do it, and we, you know, and it's all about this. I mean, you know, most of us, we read the plays, and we try and engage and get the sense of them that we can, and we get as far as we get. But the idea of actually directing Shakespeare, I mean, that is a, a very 
daunting prospect. I mean, who could do that? You know, Nobody. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I, I'm, I'm reminded of Bloom's comments somewhere that the starting point in understanding Shakespeare basically is it's, he's a lot smarter than all of us. And so, you know, it's one thing to, to engage with the plays, but to come to the point where you can say you've mastered them to, you know, present your interpretation to world-class actors in, you know, world-class venues and sophisticated audiences and critics, I mean, that's quite a leap. And so if we ask ourselves, how can one do that? Uh, you, you know, I think you're far too modest to talk about that, but I think we've had a, a sense as to how that can be done. You know, it's obviously with enormous natural talent, wonderful sensibility, broad, broad experience, and a, you know, I think we've seen tonight a ferocious engagement with this drama and mm -hmm. this playwright and this theater, you know, over many, many years, and it's ongoing and never ending. So, I mean, that is really, it, you know, to sort of open that up to all of us, it really is quite a gift. And I want to thank you uh, for your uh, generosity uh, in, in spending time with us and for your effort to try and express this wonderfully complex, never-ending, you know, uh, process to us tonight to give us a better sense as to how to open those doors. On behalf of, um, of all of the Friends of the Library and everyone here, I just want to say it's been such an honor and a privilege, a pleasure, and an absolute absolute pure undiluted delight to listen to you tonight. Thank you. And I want to say that when we uh, present when we all hopefully we all, we all have a, an opportunity to see uh, Julius Caesar and when the curtains go up and the light comes on we're going to be thinking of you Scott. Well, well thank and, you. Uh, and this is a small token of thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Yay! Is this on? Thank you so much, Joel, for your lovely thank you. And thank you, Scott, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I just want to, uh, in closing, remind people that we have two more events before the end of this uh, academic term. <clears throat> One on November 15th, which is not so far from now in the Colgate Room here in the Rare Books and Special Collections called Christmas Ain't What It Used To Be with Judith Flanders, who is a um, social historian, and she is coming out with a new book and discussing the myths, legends, and history of that season. It should be quite an entertaining and fascinating uh, evening. So it's uh, on November 15th at 5.30. And then on December the 6th, we have our annual general <coughs> meeting. And at that time, we do present our Friend of the Year Award. It's always a wonderful evening with a reception. And I'm very pleased to say that our Friend of the Year this year will be awarded to Cecil Rabinovich, who's here with us. So. As many of you as possible can join us then for that for that evening and that awarding. And uh, thank you for coming out this evening. Safe driving home. Good night.